بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Since we are in this month of striving I just wanted to share just some of the the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the early Muslims about rushing to make the most of the moments of one's life the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the sahih hadith that as-sihha wal ni'matan maghbun fihima kathir min an-nas that there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on ni'matan two blessings maghbun fihima kathir min an-nas that most people miss out on right that they're cheated off right because and the, the, the term maghbun is from losing out in a transaction right because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his life as being a transaction right in allah ashtara min almu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum aljanna that allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their their wealth in exchange for paradise right? so th- this life is a transaction right and what you put into it it's it's an investment what you put into it is the, the you will have the return in the hereafter but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on what are they as-sihhatu wal faragh right health and free time right? and this hadith is a sahih hadith related by Imam Bukhari and others and there's a number of similar transi- um, uh, narrations right two great blessings that most people miss out on health and free time right and that health they say is at different levels the, the ulama said you know the the health that you lose out on one is the health of youth right when you have strength and once you reach adulthood after a certain stage you're only going to get weaker and you're only going to get less able but the other aspect of losing out on it is the fact that while you can you know while your heart is still beat, beating while you're still breathing you still have some semblance of health right? and as long as you have it make the most of what you have right make the most of what you have don't lose out on whatever you have because sometimes people say well you know what can i do anymore i you know i, I i'm sick i'm not well this and that but you still have the basic health you as long as you're breathing you can be remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can be doing the good that is facilitated but one of the other aspects of that as well is to see that that sihha that health is a trust from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is a trust from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taking care of your health not just because you want to live for a long time but rather because This is the abode of opportunity. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked, "Who are the best of people?" He said, "Man tala umruhu wa hasuna amalu." Whoever's life is long and whose actions are good. Right? So being a little careful about what you eat at suhoor, right? Is a religious consideration not just because it's not a good thing to eat too much, but because the preservation of your health is part of intelligence. right because you're trying to maximize the good that you can attain in this life because you want to maximize the returns in the hereafter you want to attain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's closeness as one of the ulama put it so beautifully he said your body is you know, your your body is a horse that you you ride into infinity yeah, your body is a horse that you ride into infinity so take care of it right this is your uh, don't lose out right don't don't lose out and if you were you know just to look at the kinds of things people do right around ramadan you'd say you know we have some spectacular cases of ultimately it's foolishness the way we can take care of our bodies right you eat so much you're not able to get up for tahajjud you 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 eat so much you're not able a lot of people say you know i had so much at so and so's iftar i couldn't even make it to tarawih mashallah that's great right So there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on. Health and the other is free time. But health we should really look at one the moments Allah has given us 
right? Of health, that when you find within yourself the ability to pray standing, to do all these things, make the most of it. Even if you're sick, you still have the basic health. And it's a religious responsibility. Why? It is, the fuqaha tell us, it is personally obligatory to take the means to have the health that enables one to fulfill one's religious obligations. Right? Which includes, for example, taking care of your health such that you're able to pray standing. Someone who out of their own remissness, right, doesn't take care of their health, so they're not able to pray standing, they will be culpable for that. Right? Because they've fallen short of worshipping Allah as He has com commanded. Right? Well, you know, there's things that are out of one's control. Right? You have an accident, you have a bad back trouble, this and that. But someone who just overeats and doesn't take care of their health, etc., that could well be sinful. Similarly, to have the health by which you are able to fulfill your worldly responsibilities in terms of earning a lawful living, etc., this is a religious obligation. And taking care of one's health for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a door of drawing closer to Allah. The other tremendous blessing is time. Right? Two great blessings that most people lose out on, cheat themselves off, free time. And one of the biggest lies that people say is, I'm busy. Right? It, and it's, it's a lie. Many of the early Muslims, there's certain things that they didn't like asking people, nor did they like responding to. One of them was, كيف hal? How are you? They said it's both the question and, and the answer are dishonest. Right? If I were to ask Sheikh Abdullah, how are you? Right? You know, I, most, most of the time, people, no one wants to hear that, well, there's 10 problems right now. Right? It's like, how are you? You don't really mean the question. And the person who has said, oh, I'm fine. They don't really mean the answer. Imagine you go to someone's iftar and say, Uncle, how are you doing? And they say, Beta, you don't know all the trouble. Like, What's wrong with this guy? Right? So, some of, Abu Talib al Mekki mentioned this in Qutul Qur. Many of the early Muslims didn't, didn't like asking that question. And they didn't like answering it. And similarly, another question that they didn't like was, what's going on? Like, you know, how are things? Why? Because the again, the question is not honest, and the typical answer would be you know, things like, oh, I've been really busy. It's a lie. And most people, actually they say, people who do, spend extra hours at work, right? it is very rare that people put in extra hours at work are actually working. Okay? And it's just part of how the human being works, that people like the stress. So if people have like a big deadline coming, most people aren't actually doing a lot of hard work. Okay? They're sort of putting things off and you know, drinking some coffee and stressing, doodling, you know, surfing other websites, doing other things. I said, oh my God, the deadline's coming. And it's rare that someone's genuinely putting in 60, 70 hours a week. Right? There's always a lot of fluff time. It can be clear fluff, where they're just pretending to work and they're doing other things, or doing, they're doing other things on the side. And are you really busy? Usually the, the answer is no, you're not. Okay, no, you're not. Okay. Or okay, even if you are working 10 hours a day at work, 12 hours a day, what's happening the rest of the time? Right? What's happening the rest of the time? A lot of times when people get religious, one of the questions they start asking is, how do I reduce the number of hours I sleep? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that excess is not in sleep. Excess is in waking. Right? That don't worry about whether you're sleeping six hours or, or eight hours. That's only a quarter or one third of the day. What's going on the rest of the day? Right? What's going on the rest of the day? And that's something to ask oneself, that the hours of one's day, are we using them in a manner that optimizes one's standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They mention about the main teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa, Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, that لَوْ قِيلَ لِحَمَّاد أَنَّكَ تَمُوتُ غَدًا لَمَا اسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَزِيدَ مِنْ عَمَلِهِ That if Hamad was told, that you're dying tomorrow, he would not be able to increase in his good works. Because right? he was already going full tilt. Right? And you see people like that, right? Who are that careful of their time. 
Imam Ahmad used to make dua for one of the biggest criminals of Baghdad. Whenever he was mentioned, he would noticeably make dua for him. So he was asked like, why do you make dua for this man? He's a criminal. He said, because when I consider this man and the vileness of what he's engaged in, but then I look at how much he is striving to fulfill his vile aims, I can't help but reflect on my, own, my, on my own life and the nobility of what I'm striving to pursue. And he reminds me of how intensely I should be pursuing that noble matter. Right? These are signs like, you know, if you, I was, I, I had, for no good reasons, I had suhoor at a friend's house right da in downtown Toronto. After suhoor, we prayed fajr. And we're walking outside, it's like 5.30 in the morning. Downtown, we're walking, and there's all these, you know, these fit fitness centers, you know, or as one of my friends called them, fitness centers. Right? They, they have the, you know, the glass windows, because they, you know, they want people to, to see it. And there's, like, most of, we walk by two or three of them. Till, to, I don't know where we're going, actually, because we could have taken a cab right in front of his house. We were just, you know, talking about changing the world. Um, and they, they're half full at like 5.30 in the morning, right? Why? Because you know, people are seeking dunya and they're seeking it intensely, right? But one should consider like in your time, what are you trying to maximize, right? Are you losing out on, on time? Right? And that is one of the things, you know, one of the great spiritual works in the month of Ramadan is a work in which you're not actually doing anything outwardly. It is reflection. And one of the things to reflect on is your life. Right? And how are you spending your time? Right? And to do a personal, you do some personal accounting. That my weekly schedule. What do I actually do? Right? And a lot of times, you know, you ask people, do you, do you spend time with with your with with your children? I'm so busy, etc. But it's not real, right? Because we, you know, we have escapist tendencies, right? And now we have a lot of comfort zones. It's very easy to, you know, get into an internet argument with someone about something random, but I'm too busy for my son, right? You know, when's the last time you had a conversation with your daughter? Oh, things are so hectic and stuff. They're not, right? We waste a lot of time. Right? You're following the Olympics, right? And then you actually ask yourself, do you really care about, you know, like a lot of the Olympics aren't even sports, right? right? They mentioned something, someone like, there's an 80-year-old Equestrian, you know, like what, horse ri horse riding. This is Olympian who's like 80 years old competing, right? Or this la this one in in sh you know shooting is what what do they call it? Yeah, right. No, no, shoot like you know they like they, sh they shoot these guns. I don't, I'm sort of you know there's this lady who's eight months pregnant who's competing in the Olympics like why do you care about how someone can shoot right what's like what does it do for you right, right? and you ask someone what was was there a big deal no a lot of it okay you can't you're emotionally attached to soccer and whatever it makes you happy okay go but do you need to watch that much of it no like a lot of things that we do so really to, to take oneself to account that how are you spending your time? And it's not a question of just, just add extra worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? One of the greatest doors of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our social relations. How much time do you spend with your parents? How much time do you spend in excellent ways with family? How, how much time do you spend serving others? Right? Little things. Right? That, that, that have tremendous consequence. So, but I'm too busy for that. And it's not a question that you're too busy. That we're wasting too much of our time. Right? Because in reality, I was talking to a friend of mine who's you know, he's a senior HR manager for you know, a very large company. And we're talking about like hiring someone for something. He said, you know, there's, broadly, there's two theories of who, who you should hire. Right? There's one thing is to look at who's available, but another way of hiring someone right, is look at who's the busiest person and give them the job. I said, why? I said, because the person who's busiest already is making the most of their time. So they could probably, they're already doing eight things, they could probably squeeze the ninth thing in. But the person who's not really doing anything, if you give them that one thing to do, they probably won't do that either. 
right? But so, so this is something that requires serious reflection, right? And that's why there's an entire surah about time, right? Surah Al Asr, right? And to look at how one is directing one's time. And one of the best things you can do in this month is to fix your your direction in life, right? So that you are you can honestly say what that in the Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mati lillahi rabbil alameen That my life, right, so my, my prayer and my devotion, my life and my dying are all for the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds, right? So th- this is something that one should be thinking about in this month, right? And, all, and this is one of the great wisdoms that there's both a spiritual dimension to this month and a deeply social dimension to this month, right? So that we can adjust, we can recalibrate our social relations. Right? And they have a spirit, you know, the iftar is a, is a sunnah. You, we know that there's great reward in it, right? But so, so we can recalibrate those re- relationships as well, right? So we can direct ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both by devotions and in our social life. So take some time out. And sometimes it helps to actually write these things down, right? Like ask yourself, look, how do I spend my time? And how do I change my time, the way I spend my time, it's not just what you spend your time on, but the things that you do themselves, right? How do you use them? Right? The hours at work, right? the hours at work, right? That am I going to work with a high intent? Am I working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? What are the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ related to work? Right? Such as keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Have multiple high intentions in your work. What are the opportunities of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at work? Right? People take breaks in the, in the mid-morning. You, 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 you know, you know even productivity-wise, it helps to take breaks. But you take that break, spiritually, you go pray salat al-duha. Right? You, you look at what are other sunnahs related to work. And there's dozens of sunnahs related to work. You go to work with the intention of upholding good character. Of, being as, of assistance to others. It changes your attitude at work. You're not just sort of minding your own business, but you're, you're striving to be of assistance to others. Right? So you go for your lunch break, you know someone else on your, on your work team, they're not taking a lunch break because they have a deadline because they're slacking off the last three days. So you, know, you're, you go grab them a coffee and, 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 a, and a sandwich maybe or, or something. Why? Because you're, you're not just working with what's called the GSB the general state of blah, right? You're working with spiritual purpose that I'm here at work to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? By the way I conduct myself with work. By the way I do the work itself. The work itself is meant to be spiritual, right? Because you're trying to excel in that work, not just because you want to get ahead in your career, but because Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Allah has decreed excellence in all matters. So that work has a spiritual purpose. You have the intention that people benefit from this work in the best of ways. As you're thinking about your career, as one should, right? You're thinking not just about how do I get to a place where I can make more money or have more prestige, but you're thinking about how do I earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my career? Because this time that Allah has gifted me with, I want to maximize the good in it. So you see, okay, what are c- career choices that I, where I could be of greatest benefit to Allah's creation? Right? Which you may, maybe right now you're stuck in something that would be hard to argue is of particular benefit. But it pays the bills and said, it's good. Right? But you could have a plan to gradually go to something that is of genuine benefit. You know, you could, in some industries, frankly, some lines of work, like if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, there's some, you know, the kind of medicine that you're doing, you're involved with, is deeply problematic. But pays the bills, it's hard. so you say, how can I be transitioning gradually to something that is of genuine benefit to creation? That, and that changes one's thinking, right? So look carefully at, at, at your life, and it helps to write these things down. Just look at what you do in the course of the week, so that you don't fall under the category of, of people that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this hadith, that there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on. Health, and well-being. And we'll close with, with another hadith of the, the Prophet ﷺ, um, which you've 
um, that the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam told a person whom he was advising ikhtanim khamsan qabla khams that take advantage of five things before five shabab shababika qabla haramik your youth before your old age wasihataka qabla saqamik and your good health before your ill health waghinaka qabla faqrik and your wealth before your poverty right your wealth before your poverty right so when you have you, when, when you have money you should be thinking how do i seek the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this right wa faraghaka qabla shughlik and your free time before you're busy because sometimes things happen that busy you that now you don't have that discretion you know you have a parent who had who slipped down the stairs and you know you have to be taking full time care of them for example right? so now you don't have the discretion to go and study and learn and this and that so you missed out to some extent wa hayataka qabla mawtik and your life before your death right? and your life before you de- before your death so may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who, who, who take advantage of these matters. Because as one of the early Muslims, um, Muawiyah bin Qurra said, أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ حِسَابًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الصَّحِيحُ الْفَارِغِ That of the people who are most thoroughly taken into account on the Day of Judgment is a person who, ha- who had good health and free time. Right? Who had good health and free time. What did he do? Right? And really, like, look carefully because you know, so many people. And you know, my, my father is in the category of the you know the wise old uncle, right? And they say some very insightful things. One day, I was just driving with my father, he doesn't usually speak a lot. And some, you know, sometimes it gets kind of awkward with your, with your with your, especially with fathers, because you don't know what to say. And he's he's driving, and he says, Faraz, you know, the potato came before the couch." I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, you know, the way society work is structured in our time, etc. People come come back home, and they're like drained. It's like they've become a potato, and all you can do with a potato is put it on the couch, right? So he says, so the potato came before the couch, right? And there's a lot of people. They say, I don't have time for anything. But you know, what time do you get back to work? What from work? What time do you go to sleep? What do you do in those four hours, five hours, right? So really, look at that. And one of the, the ways to, to, to get things done as well, they say that you know, to, to get things done, between every two things that you do, put in a third. Between, so you, you're at home, and now you get to work. But what do you do on your commute to work? That's a great opportunity. Right? So, well, you know, I, radio. Right? And sometimes some spending of money is worth it. Like, you know, instead of spending the time listening to the radio to figure out whether there's traffic on the route, get a GPS that, that has live traffic updates. You spend $50, but you don't have to listen to the radio anymore for that. And instead, listen to something of benefit or engage in remembrance of Allah. So look at those opportunities. You have a lunch, a lunch break of an hour. Like, what do you do in that hour? Right? You have a lot of discretionary time. I have a good friend of mine, really successful professional. He reads about two or three Jews of Quran daily during work. I asked him, how do you do that? He says, basically, you, know, you, work, he works, you know, he works in bursts and stuff, and as he's working, read a few lines of Quran, do some more work, a few lines of Quran, and through the whole day, you know, lunch break before heading to lunch, that's, you know, 10-15 minutes, squeezes it in throughout the day. And he's exceptionally successful at work. But he has that sense of urgency. I, I, I am seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way that is facilitated for different people is different. Right? The doors of, of good are, are many. But we should strive to, to really do a personal accounting. That what's going on in my life? And it can help write it down and make a commitment. And one of the things, they say you can be rewarded for doing less more than you're rewarded for doing a lot. How? If the less that you take on is something that you're going to, that you're committed to making consistent throughout your life. Right? But in, it's not a call, okay, only pray four rakahs of taraweeh instead. But 
to look at all these things that, are, that you are doing, how can you convert these after Ramadan into positive routines? How can you maximize the good through them? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant us insight and understanding and also that, that He grant us beneficial knowledge and awareness of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that we're able to uphold the sunnah in the things that we do so that we can seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever circumstances He places us in. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لِيُّ لَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِيكُمْ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept her. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله one of the reminders of the month of Ramadan is of our responsibility to remember Allah subhanahu wa taala and this is a month of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most beautiful explanations of the reality and purpose and transformational nature of remembrance of Allah is one of the aphorisms, one of the hikam of Ibn Ata'illah. Ibn Ata'illah was a distinguished Egyptian scholar from the 7th Islamic century. And he was a distinguished faqih and theologian, you know, specialized in Islamic law and Islamic beliefs. But then he found his spiritual guide, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi. And after having, being a very distinguished scholar, he was teaching at Al-Azhar, he traveled the spiritual path as well. And he compiled these aphorisms. There's slightly over 200 um, spiritual wisdoms. And when he presented them to his shaykh, to Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi said, Ya Bunay, laqad lakhasta al-ihya wa zidta alayha. My son, you have summarized the ihya of Imam al-Ghazali and added to it. And it's an incredible work. Uh, and at a peak of eloquence too. It's very beautiful. And there's dozens and dozens of commentaries on it. Imam Ahmad Zarruq, who Sheikh, who, yeah, Sheikh Hamza quotes so often, he himself has 34 commentaries on this because this is something that he used to systematically teach. It was part of his spiritual teaching. He'd always be teaching on a weekly basis the hikam and each time he'd write a different commentary on it. About a number of those are published. And this is about not leaving the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the consequence of that. But there's a beautiful story related to this. Because one of the distinguished imams of Islamic spirituality in the 20th century, um, who has a book written about him as well, is Sheikh Ahmed Al Alawi from Algeria, from Mustaghanim. Martin Lings did a biography of his. In the early 1930s, he visited Damascus from North Africa, from Algeria. And Sheikh Abdurrahman al Shaghuri who is the teacher of Sheikh Nuh Keller and, and one of the distinguished um, imams of Islamic spirituality and a great theologian as well. He was at that time in his late teens or early 20s when Sheikh Ahmed Al-Alawi, this fam world famous scholar, came to Damascus. And everyone was talking about him because a big deal. Sheikh Ahmed Al-Alawi is in Damascus. And... And Shaykh Abdurrahman at that time was in his late teens, early 20s. He was quite excited too. He gathered his friends and let's go see him. And at that time, the, the, the French had, you know, because after the First World War, uh, the, the, you know, Syria was under the, the French mandate. So there's quite strong anti-French sentiment. Shaykh Abdurrahman, when he first saw Sheikh Ahmed Al Alawi, this great visiting scholar, the first thing he noticed about him was his socks. Because Sheikh, Ahmed, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman used to work in the textile industry. Like he was a scholar, but he used to work in the textile industry. And in Damascus at that time, the socks that they had available were very, were, were thick socks. They're, you know, quite rudimentary. 
this sheikh was wearing very fine socks. Right? And you know, he was in the textile industry, so he knew about good socks. And, and he's like, how could this be a sheikh? Right? Someone wearing socks like that would call himself a sheikh, because the only way you could get socks like that in Damascus were French imports. But the only people who'd wear imported French socks would be people who were deeply influenced by the French. So he's looking at him. He said, he, said he, he was young at that time and not, you know, not as mature as he perhaps should have been. He's like, like, what could he have to say about tasawwuf, about Islamic spirituality, with wearing socks like that? But he got curious, so he was following him. And you know, the Shaykh took off the, his socks to make wudu, and he's standing there, and the whole time he's like, how could this man be a sheikh? What could he have to say about the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wearing socks like that, like you know, these really fine socks? Of course, North Africa had French influence, had actually trade with the French for hundreds of years. So these kinds of things were actually quite, quite common from, from before. Right? So then the sheikh put on the socks, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman was looking at him like, so he said he sort of sat at the back of the masjid like, who is this sheikh anyways? Like, you know, what does he have to say? But then the sheikh explained this hikmah that I'll be reading to you about not leaving the remembrance of Allah. And so Sheikh Abdul Rahman initially was like, you know, whatever, you know, just get on with it. But then when Sheikh Ahmed Al-Alawi explained this hikmah, very soon Sheikh Abdul Rahman was completely attentive. And at the end he said, you know, I had to kick myself in the, in the heels and say, you know, if that's how you talk about spirituality, I don't care what kind of socks you wear, <laughs> right? Uh, because it was very profound. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رتبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man had come to the Prophet ﷺ asking for advice, right? That, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the teachings of Islam are very encompassing. So tell me something that I can hold fast to. Right? The, the teachings of Islam are very ex expansive. Right? Because at one level, Islam is very simple. Right? But at, at, at an, in another way, Islam is very deep. Right? It has both aspects. Islam is an easy religion. It's not difficult. It's, not, it's actually it is very beneficial in one's life to have the five obligatory prayers. Every... Every religious obligation has obvious, even worldly benefits, if done properly. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Sumu tasihru, Fast and you'll become healthy. Right? If you make it a part of your regular routine and learn the lessons from it. Right? So at one level it's very easy, but it also has great depth. Right? It has great depth, which is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna matin, This religion is deep. Fihi birifq, so enter into it gently. Right? Gently, don't overwhelm yourself. Right? This is, you know, this is the way of the one who's described in, in the Quran. Qumil illa qalila. Stand at night in worship, except for a little. You know, half the night, or a little more, or a little less. Right? But you can't do that tomorrow. Right? It requires this a high perfection. It requires a lot of striving. So this man came and said, "O Messenger of Allah." The teachings of Islam are so encompassing, are so vast. Tell me something I can hold fast to. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. So Ibn Ata'illah, in this aphorism that we will read, explains why we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the benefit of remembering Allah constantly, even if you're distracted. Even if you're distracted. So Ibn Ata'illah says, لا تترك الذكر لعدم حضورك مع الله فيه Do not leave the remembrance of Allah because of your heedlessness of Allah in your remembrance. Don't leave the remembrance of Allah despite your heedlessness of Allah during the remembrance. فَإِنَّ غَفْلَتَكَ عَنْ وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ أَشَدُّ مِنْ غَفْلَتِكَ فِي وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ 
Because your heedlessness of the remembrance of Allah is worse for you than your heedlessness during the remembrance of Allah. Right, so you're driving your car, you're going to work, you have 101 things in mind, right? Yeah, yeah, there's meetings in the morning and you have to do, you know, there are these projects that you have to follow up on and you have, to, you have this and that. You have a whole schedule and you're thinking about all this stuff that's going to happen and actually more important than that, you know, Ramzan is over, you're saying, okay, where am I going for lunch, <laughs> right? That's like number one, right? And then you're, did I, did I talk to the Minister of Interior about what we'll be having for dinner? And you're thinking about all these things, so you, you think to yourself, like why should, like, you know, and it's a sincere feeling, perhaps, that this is not an appropriate time to be making dhikr of Allah. My mind is busy. But Ibn Atayla says, do not leave the remembrance of Allah, despite your heedlessness of Allah, during the remembrance. Because your heedlessness of the remembrance of Allah is worse for you than your heedlessness during the remembrance of Allah. Why? He says, فَعَسَاهُ أَن يَرْفَعَكَ مِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ غَفْلَةً إِلَى ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ يَقَضَ Because it may well be that Allah will take you from remembrance in which there is heedlessness to remembrance in which there is wakefulness. وَمِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ يَقَضَ إِلَى ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ حُضُورٍ And then He may take you up from remembrance in which there's wakefulness to remembrance in which there's presence of heart with Allah. وَمِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ حُضُورٍ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرٍ مَعَ غَيْبَةٍ عَمَّا سِوَى الْمَذْكُورِ And then He may take you from remembrance in which there's presence of heart to remembrance in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the wisdom. That, that change does not happen by merely wishing it. A change happens by making something consistent. And with that consistency, you bring excellence into it. Right? Because you know, if we all decided, okay, from, that, from this moment, I'm not going to be heedless of Allah. It's not like, okay, it'll happen. Right? You need to strive. And th the nature of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that it necessarily necessarily begins with the tongue. And from the tongue, it goes towards the heart. So the heart becomes wakeful. You know, the, some of the meanings will come. But then from wakefulness, you have presence of heart. You're active. It's not just that you have moments of consciousness, but your, your, your heart is present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then if that dhikr continues, it goes from presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a state described by the Prophet sallallahu that al-ihsan and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara. That spiritual excellence is that you enter into a state of worship of Allah as though you behold Him. And if you behold Allah, you're absent from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it goes from, he, from dhikr in which there's heedfulness to dhikr in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. And then Ibn Ata'illah says, وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيز And that is not difficult for Allah. That is not difficult for Allah. Right? That the fruits of one's spiritual works, of one's remembrance, are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to take the means. And this is one of the means that one should strive to bring into one's life. To make, it's the prophetic counsel. لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Even if your, your heart and mind aren't all there. Because eventually it will become like second nature. Like the before when you start driving a car, you, know, that's, you have to be thinking. If you go back to when you first started driving a car, you know, the whole mind, especially if you learn how to drive stick, sh stick shift, right? You have to be thinking, okay, first gear, now put it into second gear, now put it into third gear. It, it requires thinking. Automatic is a bit, e is much easier. But still, like, you, know, you have to be thinking, okay, do, you, you have to be... Yeah, let me look around now, let, check rear view mirror, check this. You're thinking about all these things. But then become second nature. You can have a conversation with someone while driving the car. You can be listening to, to a podcast or the radio or whatever, and you're driving the car. Right? Similarly, with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other activities. Right? And of course, this is not at every moment. You're, you're, you're having a meeting with someone, you might not be 
it may not be appropriate to be engaged in the remembrance of Allah while someone's telling you <laughs> about the business report, right? Or someone is making a presentation and you're obviously engaged in dhikr. But much of our, much of the moments of our life, even, you know, you're, just, you're sitting with friends and family and, you know, uncles talking about, you know, episode 246 of Pakistani politics. So what do you do? Instead of just sitting there passively, you can still listen. You you quietly to yourself without making a, a show. Just engage in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is that becomes transformative, right? This is the, the prophetic counsel. Right? So there's a, a, a few comments regarding this that um, Imam Ahmad Zarruq, from one of his commentaries on, on the hikam that he mentions, that when the author says, don't leave the remembrance of Allah because of your lack of heedlessness of Allah in the remembrance, he says that rather, you know, what we understand, i.e. from Islamic teachings, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, is that one should be striving to remember of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever circumstances one is in. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, regarding remembering Allah, كَذِكْرِكُمْ أَبَائِكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرَ that you should remember Allah as you remember your parents or more intensely than that. Meaning, the, the way you, know, you, you think about worldly matters, right? You're always thinking about something. That you should be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah like you remember worldly matters, but rather, even more so. I mean, if you think about how much time we spend thinking about worldly matters, how much time we spend thinking about Allah, we should be thinking about Allah at least as much, if not more. But the way you do it is you engage in the remembrance of Allah, regardless of what you're engaged in. Okay? And this is one of the, the, the aspects of Islamic spirituality. That the Islamic spirituality is lived not in retreat from one's worldly concerns, but it's lived through one's worldly concerns. Right? The believer, with their, they're at work and they're excelling at work, but their heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're with family and you, you strive to have the best of character, to be the most helpful and most concerned member of your family. But your heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? They say it's a bit like the, you know, the... The, the court of the king, right? That you're... You, that the, there's, the king has a court, but then he has private chambers, right? And the one who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in their general life, they're in the court, but they're also with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their private moments, right? That, and it becomes a situation where one is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if one's tongue is not busy with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was the state of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Sahaba were, were once shocked because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went to sleep and he was lying down and he got up and he went to pray. And the Sahaba had immaculate adab with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but they're also very straightforward. If they saw something that they didn't understand, with the utmost of adab and respect, they would ask. And that's one of the aspects of adab that are ignored. And that we should instill, that we should be, have the highest of manners and respect for our scholars, for our elders, and instill that even in our children. Right? That they should be able to, to question us, but with respect. That if they see us doing something strange, to ask, Dad, I, I just wanted to, to know, you know. Um, and with full respect, that they should be able to object. Right? But respectfully. So the Sahaba says, Ya Rasulullah, You've, you, you've told us that if you go to sleep lying down, you, 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 we, we should make wudu. But we, we saw you sleeping, and now you're praying. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am not like you. My eyes sleep, yet my heart is awake. Right? My, my eyes sleep. And the ruling of that is unique to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he was, his sleep was a state of complete wakefulness such that he was in a complete state of remembrance for Allah. And that's from what's considered, there's an aspect of the sunnah, that, you know, the sunnah can be haram to follow. 
Right? The, the sunnah, there are certain things that the Prophet ﷺ did that are haram to follow. They're called the khasais. The things that are unique to the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a wisdom to them. Right? That we are commanded to emulate him. But there's certain things that are distinct about, about the Prophet ﷺ. Right? And these are things that are not like dispensations for the Prophet ﷺ. But they all show his high rank right? and higher level of relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Even while sleeping, his heart was still in slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But it becomes a constant state because true remembrance is remembrance of the heart. Right? And the, the, the tongue wakes up the heart. They say it's like a house right? in which on the ground floor is this really lazy person right? who's asleep. Okay. And you know, your goal is to wake up that lazy person and get them to be doing something meaningful in life. So to wake the person up, you have to make some noise. Right? So you're, you're on the... You know, your bedroom is on the first floor, right? That's like where the tongue is. The heart is asleep on the ground floor. So you got to make some, make some noise so that eventually the heart you know, wakes up and says like, what's going on up there? And once it wakes up, it'll start hearing what it's saying. Then it'll get closer to, okay, what exactly are you talking about? And then it'll understand. And then the meaning of what was being said will go into the heart. But you have to wake up the heart. And the heart takes time to wake up. And one of the wisdoms of that struggle is that it expresses sincerity. Right? It expresses sincerity because if being conscious of Allah was so easy that you didn't have to strive for it, it wouldn't require any sincerity. Anyone could do it. Right? But it's just a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that something that is precious requires effort. Right? And part of the, that requirement of effort is, do you really want it? Right? Do you really want it? This is why they say, alamatu hubbi hubbu dhikrihi. The sign of loving Allah is the love of His remembrance. And the sign of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is loving His remembrance. Right? And, th- and this is a divine command. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 42, Allah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah with much remembrance. Dhikran kathira. Wasabihuhu bukratan wa asila. Because he doesn't simply say, Uthkurullah kathiran. He says, Uthkurullah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah with much remembrance. And that's not sufficient. He says, Wasabihuhu bukratan wa asila. And glorify him. By morning and by night. Sabbihuhu from tasbih. Right? But it, they, they say here, it's not referring simply to saying subha- you know, subhanallah, for example. But glorify him in your remembrance. By morning and by night. Right? And many, many other in verses. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ right? Those who believe, what is their state? They're more intense in their remembrance of Allah. In their love of Allah. Why? Because they remember Allah at all their times. Those who remember Allah standing and sitting and on their sides. Right? And the Prophet said, right? Should I not tell you of the best of your actions? And it's a Sahih hadith. And the purest of your actions with your Lord. Right. And better for you than giving gold and silver in charity. And better for you than for you to meet your enemy and for you to fight them and for them to fight you. The Sahaba said, Do tell us, O Messenger of Allah, you know, what is better for you than any other work? More beloved to Allah, better than, than charity, better than jihad. Do tell us, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Dhikrullahi Azza wa Jal, the remembrance of Allah, mighty and majestic. Ibn Hajar al Asqalani in Fath al Bari, his commentary on Sahih al Bukhari, explains because anything that is done with remembrance of Allah 
is greater than that very same thing done without the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any action. And in reality, the very purpose of every other action is the remembrance of Allah. Why do we pray? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّنِي أَنَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God but me. فَعْبُدْنِي So therefore, worship me. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ And establish the prayer for my remembrance. What is, what is meant to be the state of the believer in their work, in their business, in their leisure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the, you know, right after the ayat al-Nur, the verse of light, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَن ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ right? Those accomplished ones whom neither trade nor transaction busies away from the remembrance of Allah and establishing the prayer and giving zakat, etc. Right? So the state, the desired state of the believer at work is what? That their work does not distract them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they work and they excel in their work. But they're working because the work itself is done for the sake of Allah. Seeking the pleasure of Allah. Striving in everything they do at work to make it pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in that, they are engaged in the remembrance of Allah. And one of the aspects of the remembrance of Allah is the remembrance of Allah beautifies everything else. Why? Because if you're walking down the street, right? So Zubair is walking down the street and he's sort of just in a GSB, general state of blah. He's just sort of thinking about Zubaydah and how will he ever talk to Uncle Jamil that he wants to marry her. And he's scared stiff of Uncle Jamil, right? Because um, he used to give him a hard time doing taraweeh when he was a kid, and he's been scared of him since. Right? So he's just thinking about this and that, and you know, looking here and there, checking his, you know, his Twitter feed, um, and just distracted. Right? So how will he be in his walking? Right? He just be drifting down the street. Whereas what was the sunnah of the Prophet while walking? It won't even be in his mind. But someone who walks, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be walking with purpose. And if you're remembering Allah with your tongue, it's only a, a step or two away from the critical question in life. How do I walk in a manner that's pleasing to Allah? So you're going to walk with purpose. You're going to walk. How did the Prophet ﷺ walk? Because that's... Okay, so you walk with resolve. The Prophet ﷺ... You know, read about his walking. It's incredible. The Sahaba talked so much about how the Prophet ﷺ walked. He walked as if he was walking down, down a hill. Right? He used to walk with purpose. He used to walk fast. The Sahaba said, we, used to, we, used to, we were younger than him, but we used to struggle to keep up with him. Yet he used to walk with complete composure and grace. Right? They said it was like a, a ship that was cutting through the ocean. Right? Majestic. Yet, you know, people who walk fast. Right? If, if you have like, you know, if, if your boss is walking down the corridor and they're walking fast, would you stop them? No. You know, someone who's walking like purposefully, just, you know, they're going somewhere. So you just leave them alone. Yeah. Like after prayer, Brother Asif's like, whoo, headed out of the door. So he must be busy, you leave them alone. But he, though he walked fast and with purpose and resolve, he walked with such calm and grace and concern for those around him that no one would hesitate to stop him, sallallahu alayhi wa Because he combined between complete majesty and complete mercy, a right? complete concern. Right? So but if you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be reminded of these sunnas. Right? You walk, the Prophet saw someone who's walked, he'd always be smiling, he'd always be cheerful. If he passed by someone, he would be the first to initiate greetings. And this is not just a sunnah for Muslims. You're walking down the street, you pass by someone, we should be the first of people to be upholding those social graces. Right? Of making eye contact, of smiling, of saying those little things. You know, uh, sometimes, just the question, issue, sometimes just a, a nod would be appropriate. Other times you, you, you greet. You know, with, with, the etic, with the best of the etiquette that is suitable to one's context. Right? In other situations at work, you know someone, you know, 
you, you'd say those social niceties. But if you're in a state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your walking would be different. You're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your talking would be different. You, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your spending time with your parents would be different. And you having suhoor would be different because you won't just sit there, you, you remember all the p- p- opportunities you have of seeking Allah's pleasure. I don't just sitting there waiting for everyone else to do whatever. You'd be the first person to serve other people, to try to give them water, to help clear up. Right? Because that's... You know, so, th- that's what one else? of the... Which is why, and we'll you know, close with this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the prophetic example, He says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily you have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ for whoever seeks Allah and the last day. Right? You have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples for whoever seeks Allah and the last day. But then it mentions something that people forget. وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And makes much remembrance of Allah. Why? Because you know, if you go to Sister Zubaydah, who Zubair wants to marry, and she, you know, she's sort of just drifting in her deen. You know, she used to have attend classes at the MCC when Sheikh Yahya was here, but then Sheikh Yahya left, and you know, she didn't take any of the new classes that MCC started after Ramadan. So she's just drifting, you know. So you ask her, do you, do you think you should be following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? No Muslim would say, no, you know, I don't think so. It's not in my 2012 plans. No one would say that. You see your family members who may be not as religious, you ask her, do you think you should be following the Prophet ﷺ? No one would say, no, I don't think so. But why doesn't it happen? Right? Everyone would accept that yes, we have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. But there's two aspects that make us not follow the Prophet ﷺ. One is, Allah SWT says, you have in him the most beautiful of examples. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ For whoever seeks Allah in the last day. Right? So you need to have that sense of purpose that you're seeking Allah SWT in life. But the other one is, وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And makes much remembrance of Allah. What brings that sense of purpose into one's life, that I need to be seeking Allah, no one would say, no, uh, uh, I don't think I should be seeking Allah and, and the next life. Dunya is enough for me. No Muslim would say that. right? But what is it that keeps them from actually making that a reality in their life? It's the lack of remembrance of Allah. You have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. Whoever seeks Allah in the last day, how is that sense of seeking Allah stirred up through the remembrance of Allah? Because that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're making Allah primary in your concern and consciousness. That's what remembrance of Allah is. And it is that remembrance then that then brings into mind the urgency of taking the Messenger وسلم, as your example. And not just as any example. To take him as the example in the most beautiful of ways. Because right? he, mo- he's the most beautiful of examples. He's not just an example. He's the most beautiful of examples. Whoever seeks Allah in the last day and makes much remembrance of Allah. That's why the remembrance of Allah is something that we should strive to make an integral part of our life. How do we do that? First is, have routine, daily routines of remembrance. And the Prophet ﷺ told us how and when. He said, strive for complete uprightness in life but know that you'll fall short. So what do you do? He gave us three keys. He said, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا Three words. Right? And this is, it, you know, this is from the Jawami al-Kalim, the encompassing words of the Prophet فَسَدِّدُوا Remain steadfastly committed. Do the best you can. If you can't do something completely, you know you're falling short, don't say, well, that's how I am. No. Do the best you can. You know you're falling short. Yeah. You're not, you know, you, you heard that the Prophet ﷺ prayed eight rakahs of night worship. So the first few days of Ramadan you did it. Now you're struggling to do eight rakahs. I ah, can't do it. Can't do the whole thing. Do the best you can. You're not able to do eight, do four. Can't do four, do two. I can't do them like lengthy. Do them fast. Right? But, so said they do. Remain steadfastly committed. Do the best you can. وَأَبْشِرُ And be of glad tidings. Because it's a tremendous gift. You're trying to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing the best you can to do that. Right? It's a tremendous place to be. And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالْغَدْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الدُّلْجَةِ And seek assistance in the early mornings and the late afternoons and a little of the depths of the night. Seek assistance in what? In striving for that complete uprightness, that complete Allah centricity, right? But you know you'll fall short. So what do you do? Remain steadfastly committed. Do your best and be of glad tidings. How do you make that happen in your life? Seek assistance in three critical times. The early mornings, the ghadwati, which is the beginning of the day. And he left a general because someone could do it at Fajr time. Someone could do it before they head off to work. Right? Most people take an incredible amount of time even if they think they're in a rush, take a, you know, it doesn't take that long to have breakfast, you know, reading the, you know, you, you, know, you check your Flipboard app on your, on, on your iPad, and you know, you've, even though you live on, on the West Coast, you're subscribed to the New York Times. Um, and, you know, just, you know, if you were to do some, what's called, you know, you know net eternal analysis, NEA, right? or ERA, Eternal Return Analysis, anything you read in the New York Times couldn't possibly be as beneficial to you as remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? as reciting a little bit of Qur'an. Right? The fact that Romney dissed Obama in Oklahoma I, has nothing to do with... The only thing that matters is really to, to be an inf, informed that on, the, on election day, when you put your vote, who should you be voting for? Most of the news that you'll find out about is kind of useless anyway. It's not that important to know that did Phelps finally win his 22nd medal or not. Big deal. Right? You could find that out. But seek assistance in the early mornings. Have some routine of remembrance of Allah, of Qur'an, of dhikr at that time. rohati And the rawha is the, refers to the time of rest, which is when people finish work and they get home. Or it also refers to the, the time of returning home. Right? That late afternoon, once you're done work, and this is usually, they say, around Asr time, but it, the Prophet ﷺ left a general, because people's circumstances differ, on your return home, because you're done work now. And actually, even productivity-wise, people who stretch their work to all times of the day, it's not good for stress levels. It's actually not good for productivity. You'll get actually less done at work. Uh, you know, it's good to have a time where you're focused on work, and times when you're doing other things. So you're done work, take a break. You know, on your car ride back, unless it's something really urgent, which... Most things aren't. Right? Take a break. R- remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Or do, do something else of, of benefit. Or once you get home. Right? What, what do you do once you get home? You spend some time with the family. You, know, you freshen up, etc. Then what, what are you doing? Engage in a little remembrance of Allah. Right? And, and by a little, five minutes. Right? We're not saying hours. You, if, uh, once you got home every day, you, you engage in five minutes of remembrance of Allah. After spending time with the family, etc. By the end of the year, that would add up to 30 hours of worship that you've engaged in. وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّلْجَةِ And something of the depths of the night. And the expression in Arabic is so beautiful. وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّلْجَةِ Some, you know, something of the depths of the night. As if the depths of the night are this really rich treasure. Uh, you, you know, just or you know, dip into it just a little bit. So I was telling this to a relative of mine from my wife's side, one, so from one of my in-laws. Say, so so it's, it's like, you, you mentioned a, a Hyderabadi sweet dish. Right? So it's like that, like it's really rich. And I don't like that sweet dish. So I said, well, something like that. Right? It's like this, this something really rich that she in min she and a little of the depths of the night, right? That even a little worship at that time will change your life, right? And this is something you, if you can institute that in your life, and this is what Ramadan is teaching us, right? That one of the great wisdoms they say, even if you're full, you should still get up for sahur and have a little something. One of the wisdoms of that is that it's easier to convince yourself to have. Some suhoor. It's harder to convince yourself to get up and pray two rakahs. But we finish suhoor 10-12 minutes before Fajr time. Why? So that you can engage in a little remembrance of Allah at that time. Right? But try to make a commitment. 
you're able to do it for 30 days in this month, or 29, try to carry that on the rest of your life. Get up 10 minutes before Fajr, engage in some worship, and you're able to get to work the rest of the year, you know, during this month, you can do it the rest of the year. Right? And this will be transformative. Right? If you can't do it all the time, do it on weekends. Right? And keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. In your daily business of life, it's not that difficult to walk to your car. Most of us can do it without too much struggle. Although I, str- I have a good, <laughs> I have a tendency to stumble and trip and bump into things. But yeah, it's not that difficult to walk. So what are you doing while you're walking? Nothing much. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're driving, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're in the mall. It's not that difficult to get to the store you want to get to. You want to get to the Apple store and finally buy you know, the MacBook Pro with the retina display. If you want. But what, what are you doing in the meantime? Nothing much really. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And it'll take you up in the levels of remembrance. From remembrance in which there's heedlessness to remembrance in which there's wakefulness. And remembrance in which there's wakefulness to remembrance in which there's presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To that remembrance in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. And that's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who become of those who are constant in their remembrance of Allah and whose remembrance is transformative. So it changes our, uh, us in our relationship with Allah and changes.